what's happening though? Can you tell me? It's going to turn into a leaf. What? You can see that already? No. But yes. Can math tell a story? That is the question for a mathematics YouTube channel. Like, I mean, every video I make has to have some story to it, even if it's something silly. But in math itself, just the dry definitions and the theorems themselves, that doesn't say anything unless you find a way to string them together. And that's sort of my job. But there are some parts of mathematics that really tells its own story. And one such area of mathematics is the study of limits, which you know led to calculus and all the other good stuff. But it starts with Hippasus of Metapontum, who discovered that there is a problem with rational numbers. And we can follow a route that takes us from Hippasus all the way up to the 20th century and making really cool fractals. Okay, so I just finished playing around in Photoshop and finally getting a uh, fractal generator working. And what it really takes is uh, Photoshop Actions, so you can just keep pressing play and getting something new happening over and over again. So this sort of iteration scheme, and this fits in with this sort of fixed point iteration idea. So the idea is that we're making a contractive mapping from compact sets to compact sets. Our compact sets are just pictures on a white background, and our transformations are these you know, rotations, scalings, and flippings, and things like that, and translations, etc. You just have to make them just right, and it took me three tries in order to get uh, the Barnsley fern out of it, but I did get some neat ideas along the way. But let's talk about what Hippasus discovered. So Hippasus of Metapontum, Met Metapontum, Metapontum, I really don't know how to pronounce that, but Hippasus was a Pythagorean, which is a cult of mathematicians from around, say, 500 BC. And these guys believe that everything was either an integer or a ratio of integers. And Hippasus did the one thing that anybody would do after you discovered the Pythagorean theorem. You take a look at the unit square and you see that it's actually a combination of two right triangles. Well, a unit square has one side length of one and another side length of one and that diagonal then according to the Pythagorean theorem should be square root of two. And if it is a square root of two, then if the square root of two should be rational, you should be able to find an A over B that will give you square root of two. And well, Hippasus found that there is no such a or B. And well, the Pythagoreans did exactly what you expect a cult of people who were studying mathematics would do. They, they took him out on a boat and drowned him in the ocean. Or, well, probably the Mediterranean because the ocean is a bit far from Greece, but you get the idea. Okay, so what I did is I started with just my channel logo because I mean, it's totally fire, right? Anyway, so then I shrank it down. I'm trying to get a stem. So I squish it and I move it down and then that's my first action. And then I make another copy of the logo and I rotate it and move it down onto the side. And this is, should give me one of the branches of the Barnsley Fern. And, but yeah, we'll see how that works out. And I take that and I do it again. And then I take the original copy up and I chipped up and rotate slightly. And so that should take these two branches I just made and move them up. And so then the branches should just duplicate, 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 duplicate. And with that nice little turn to it, it should give us a nice curve to make it look ferny and not just some static like triangle. So that's what I did. And I do the same operation to to the fern each time. What's interesting is that I actually got three completely different pictures with these same rough operations. So he passed this didn't meet a good fate. And what it told us immediately was that mathematics was kind of broken and that we didn't have a good way, a good language of expressing mathematics in, in any way that we would find consistent. And in fact, that language didn't even come about until like the 1800s with Cantor and Dedekind. Now the Greeks, while they were kind of freaked out about this, they did still try to work with the square root of two and most square roots in general. And so we have this thing called Heron's formula, which was a method that cleverly used averages in order to get better and better approximations of the square root of any number. And it can get several digits with each iteration. And so this gives us a sequence of rational numbers that would converge to something like the square root of two. And so this gives us our first example of say limits. Then the next one was this hardcore spiral that I ended up getting because I moved it up and I rotated it a little bit too much. Much. And so you end up getting this huge arc all the way back and, and it spirals in on itself. And that that was neat, but it's still not the Barnsley Fern. And you and the stem itself wasn't squished enough, so it ends up having this like big curve to it, which is kind of 
unappealing. What does it mean for limits to converge in the first place? So on this table here, I'm just going to arrange a whole bunch of minifigures, and each one of these is going to be a member of a sequence. And they're trying to converge to this point there in the middle. As we add more minifigures to here, we're going to be getting closer and closer to that limit point. But what does it mean to get closer to that? Well, for any boundary we put around this limit point, eventually we're going to hit one minifigure that's outside of it, and then after that, every minifigure is going to be inside. And so that tells us that eventually an entire tail of our sequence is going to be inside of that boundary. And if I make it smaller, that just means we need a further tail in order to do that. But you're always going to be able to find some tail that's contained entirely in there. And that's what it means to converge. In mathematics speak, what we're saying is that a sequence PN converges to a point P if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N in our integers such that for all little n bigger than the capital N, we are going to have that the distance between Pn and P is going to be less than epsilon. Now, if we take out that middle point, can we determine if this sequence should converge? And the answer is yes and no. If you take a look at these minifigures, what you can also determine is that the distance between each one of them is also going to be very small. And so if you replace P with just Pm, then you get the definition of what we call a Cauchy sequence. Now this Cauchy sequence is something that morally should converge, but it doesn't always. And in fact, if we take a look at the Heron sequence of approximated square roots, we can get an approximation of square root of 2 in that sequence of rational numbers that doesn't converge inside the rational numbers. And so we have a Cauchy sequence that doesn't actually converge. Now when every Cauchy sequence does converge inside of, say, a metric space, then we call that metric space complete. And complete metric spaces are the lifeblood of analysis. And in fact, if we find a set like the rational numbers, we go through and complete it in order to get something new, a complete space. And in this case, with the rational numbers and the metric of just the absolute value of the difference between two points, we get the reals. Now, when you have a complete metric space, you can do all sorts of really cool things with it. And one thing you can do is we use a Banach fixed point theorem. We talked about this in a previous video, and it, it's, it's really cool. And I think the Bonnick fixed point theorem really sings when you look at it, when you apply it to compact sets to get fractals. And so in order to get a fractal, what we're going to do is we're going to take these mappings that are called contractive mappings. And if you take a set of points and you apply a contractive mapping to it, the image of these points are actually closer together by some proportion, less than one. And so then when this happens, you can keep applying this transformation over and over again, and it gets to what we call a fixed point. And this fixed point, when you use it in the context of compact sets and what are called iterated function systems, actually gives you a fractal. So then what I did is I actually cheated. I took a picture of the Barnsley fern, and then I, in order to get the right transformations, I actually took the fern and I crushed it down as completely as I could and matched the existing stem. And that was my first transformation. And the next one, I took the whole fern and I rotated it and I squished it onto one branch. And then for the other branch, I flipped the image and then I rotated it and squished it until it fit there. And finally, I did a big copy and shifted it up and rotated and fit it until the bottom leaves matched the next leaves and the tip of the fern matched the tip of the fern. And when I did that, that was it. I mean, th those were the exact transformations. And so then I could put any image I wanted. And so, you know, going back to my logo, why not? And then just push play. And it ends up spinning out the entire Barnsley fern, which is totally cool. And you can start with anything. You can start with a picture of a minifigure. You can start with a picture of your cat. And they all converge to exactly the same uh, Barnsley fern. And you just keep hitting play enough and you will get the same image out. Now, if you had colors or any sort of gradient in your image, then that might show up in the fern itself. But if everything was black and white, you know, same exact image every time. All right, so let's go ahead and thread the loop here. So we start off with Hippasus, who discovered that there are numbers that are not rational. This told us that there is more to the real numbers than, say, writing A over B. Now, this didn't show that the rational numbers weren't complete. It just showed us that there were concepts that were not expressible as rational numbers. We didn't have a real idea of what a real number was at the time. Then Heron came along, and this was probably 
a good like 500, 600 years later and showed us that we can get rational approximations of the square root of any number. And so I think this was around like what, 50 AD or something? I'll put the actual date around here. And so that is what showed us that the rationals weren't complete, that we were able to have a sequence of rational numbers that were approximating irrational numbers. Now we still didn't have this idea of completeness yet. And that took a long time. We had people like Oresme who showed that the harmonic series diverged. We had all sorts of different ideas of what limits could possibly mean. We didn't get to a good idea of limits until we had like Cauchy, Dedekind, Weierstrass, Cantor, and people like that. And it was Cantor that gave us the ability to take any sort of metric space and complete it by looking at what are called Cauchy sequences. And so this is when we had the real idea of completeness. And using this, we have the Banach fixed point theorem, which you know started with people like Picard who came up with his existence and uniqueness of differential equations using this iterated method and exploited completeness of continuous functions. And then you have people like Barnsley, where in his paper, he showed you how to get the Sierpinski gasket or the Barnsley fern by using these iterated function systems. So we start with Hippasus who discovered that there are problems with real numbers and we go all the way up to fractals by refining each of our definitions one bit at a time. So that's the story of completeness and well, limits, or at least a part of the story. If you like the video, then please you know, go ahead and give a thumbs up and like and subscribe and all that good stuff. And otherwise, I hope you have a good day.